Hello, and welcome to Michael Chekhov Master's Talk. It is my honor today to have my uh, colleague, my dear Sarah Kane, who I've known for many, many years. So um, Sarah Kane is, I would say, a world-renowned master voice teacher and Chekhov teacher. And we first met in 1992 when Jörg Andres and Jobst Langhans created what became known as the first International Michael Chekhov Association. And, uh, and then we were in Moscow the following year, both of us yeah. as original founders of the organizing board of the International Michael Chekhov Association. And Sarah in 1994 hosted the famous um, great Third great international Michael Chekhov <laughs> yes. workshop. It had some, I don't know, close to 300 people. So Sarah, this is Sarah Kane, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. And uh, it has been a, a quandary of mine in my Chekhov training to learn how to interface the voice work. I began my training with Ted Pugh in, uh, well, the, the first training I began in a play, which was a full length play that had no dialogue. And then I began my formal training with, uh, uh, with Ted Pugh and we did not do any speech work. We didn't even say a monologue until two years of training. Wow. Um, so it was at that point that I, came to realize uh, when Ted and, and then Fern and the Actors Ensemble's first production um, had amazing, powerful checkoff work until the words were spoken and then the atmospheres collapsed and the gestures just disappeared. So we began to sort of really understand how voice needed to come into the work. And so Sarah, will you, will you share with us a little bit more about your background and uh, mm -hmm go from there. Thanks. Yeah, very, very briefly. Um, my mother sent me to speech classes when I was seven years old because um, she wanted me to grow up speaking properly. You know, it's very possible in the UK to drop syllables and sort of speak like that and nobody understands a word you're saying, right? So I was, and it's a sign of class. And my mother definitely wanted me to, to sound proper. Um, and that was something I continued into my adolescence. And then I dropped it. The whole thing became too embarrassing. And it wasn't until my, I was in my late 20s that I decided this was something I really wanted to pursue seriously. So I began a training at that time in, in what was called Steiner's creative speech. I sometimes call it Steiner speech now, um, which uh, took me a long time to finish because um, in theory, it's a four year full time training. It took me about 10 years because I kept on having breaks in between to just survive and make sure I, I could live, you know, working in between and then going back and doing another year until I finally finished in my mid 30s. And basically ever since then I have been teaching it. So, um, and it's been something that it, it's just a, a, an amazingly central part of my biography, as one can tell, you know, I started speech when I was seven. Um, and, uh, well, it's something I'm still doing. So I've just now finished teaching a, a speech course on zoom with some actors in Paris who I have been teaching once a month for the last nine months. Yeah. Thank you. And would you share with us a little bit about how you came upon or what stage of your life you came upon Michael Chekhov's work and yeah. how, how that came to you? Um, it came in my first year of my speech training, which also included some acting. Um, it wasn't the main focus, but we certainly did do some acting. Uh, and the teacher who was teaching us had discovered the Chekhov book and he came into class with the Chekhov book in his hand. I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this was 1978. 
it was a long time ago. And nobody knew anything about Chekhov then, you know, 40 years ago. And, uh, and he was doing exercises with us. And one exercise made an incredibly deep impression on me the very first time I did it. And that was the exercise with the ideal center. And it became clear to me, I, I sort of, it, it was almost like an electric shock. And I, it just became very clear, I have to do something with this. I have to work with this in some way. I have to find out how to do more of this. And it, it, the same thing happened in different ways to some other of the students. So we would sit and we would read the book and we would discuss it, this, as I say, in, in this training. Um, and it really began there. And any opportunity after that, if I came across one of the people who'd worked with Chekhov in some way, so my first encounter was, was with an Australian called Graham Dixon. And he had a little theatre company. And uh, that was the beginning. I got Graham to organise some real Chekhov workshops. This was in the center of Germany at the time, and I collected all the English, English speakers I could find, etc. So that, that was the beginning of the journey, really. And um, just a little side note, can you tell us a little bit about your ger German fluidity? Oh, right. Yeah, well, I studied German at university. I, I mean, I learned it at school. I studied it at university. And then I've spent a number of years living in the country. So I, I am basically, I've become bilingual. Um, and I actually teach Chekhov in German in some parts of Germany, which is a bit of a bizarre thing to do. But I, I simply have a, uh, I'm very um, comfortable with other languages. Let's put it like that. So I've now even started teaching Chekhov in French as well because not all of these uh, Parisians that I'm working with speak English. The French are pretty particular about their own language. So they're having to put up with my awful accent, but they would prefer that to, to being translated. So that's what's happening. Yeah. Great. And can you tell us how you connected with Jobst and Jorg for that first international workshop in 92? Right. Yeah. That's a bizarre thing because um, in the middle of nothing, completely unprompted, I got this letter, which was an invitation. I mean, in the, those days, you know, in that was 1991, I think, when the probably or end of 91, something like that, when the invitation went out and they were putting feelers out to find out who's out there, who's doing Chekhov, where, where is it alive, right? I mean, I don't know how they found you, but I got this letter sent to this place. I, I had finished my speech training a couple of years before. I was running a part-time, a 20 hour a week speech and drama training at a college here in the UK, Emerson College, where we had the first or the, the third workshop. And um, uh, this letter appeared and, anybody know anything about anything about Chekhov so I replied to it I have no idea why it got sent to Chekhov because I hadn't met them before I didn't know them it was really in that was in the hands of the gods I would say that I got that letter because I was dead keen on Chekhov by that time I'd met all the ancient monuments as they called themselves Deirdre Hurst Dupre, Felicity Mason Eleanor Faison, Heard Hatfield, all the people who'd actually studied with Michael Chekhov. And I'd worked with them in a London workshop and I was just raring to go with this stuff. Well, I, um, you know, was teaching with Mala Powers yeah. and, at the time. And so Mala got the invitation. Right. And I was, for the first time in my life, actually going to go on a real vacation with my husband right. um, to Europe for our, our first time. He had been to Copenhagen, but ne nowhere else. So we yes. did uh, one of those tours, uh, you know, 21 countries in two days, whatever. Um, 
and we spent a whole lot more money on it than we meant to. And so there was no budget for me to go to, to Berlin. And that was, uh, the tour was in June mm -hmm. of 1992. And the Berlin was in August. Mm -hmm. And when I came home from my one month of touring and spending way too much money, <laughs> uh, my mailbox contained over $10,000 worth of residuals from wow. commercials that I had running, which of course I had, uh, you know, as an actress, um, a very successful career using Michael Chekhov's work. Mm -hmm. And I literally opened the mail and found $10,000 worth of checks. And I immediately called up Mala and said, Mala, do you think it will be all right if I come? And she um, sent a fax to Yobst and Jorg, and they said, we have no place for her to sleep. Um, but if she can sleep on the floor of your room, Mala, we're fine and we'd love to have her come and love to have her do a workshop. So um, I literally slept on the floor next to Mala's bed and um, brought my you know, and, and went to the workshop, which was, of course, life changing. And uh, I offered my uh, audition workshop there. That's right. I remember. I remember. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. That's a good story. Yeah. So uh, can you tell us uh, at what stage did you start sort of weaving Chekhov and voice together and, and just a little bit more about that part? We actually had some Chekhov work in this speech training, right? The, the one um, in my final year when I moved back from Germany to the UK and needed to find a way. I just, I just needed the piece of paper. I needed the qualifications. And we had somebody who had studied with Deirdre Hurst Dupre, um, whose name eludes me at the moment. But because she was also one of the speech students, you know, we would regularly bring up these questions, but it, it's only really when you sort of get into practice of both techniques that you begin to feel, okay, so my speech instrument has something to do with my physical instrument, with my movement instrument, something like that, right? Um, so it was from the, from the get-go, and I would say I'm, I'm still permanently making discoveries about the interrelationship between the two it just doesn't stop right yes um so i so one thing that steiner developed which is wonderful for actors that you will know about because i i think we've we've dealt with them before um are what he calls the six or the seven speech gestures right and it's taken me to and i've always had this question what is the relationship between Chekhov's archetypal gestures and the speech gestures, right? Historically, I do know that Michael Chekhov had notes sent to him of the 18 lectures that Rudolf Steiner held in September 1924 about the contents of those lectures. And those seven speech gestures are sort of right at the beginning. They're a very central element. They sort of open the door to this relationship between speaking and moving, right? The, the, the question of the relationship between speaking and moving. And um, it took me, yeah, until, oh, well, it's in the last two years where I can say the difference for me is now really clear that the gestures make, if I may say it, if I may put it this boldly right now, it's the gestures are about the words because the speech technique is, is not about my voice. It's about words mm -hmm. and it's about the nature of the words. The gestures tell you every, what you need to know about the words. Whereas the archetypal gestures are, are much more clearly in relationship to a, to a character. Right? So, you can use both at the same time and they will both tell you something different about the nature of the text that you're working with. Whereas 
I've been going, well, how do they? And, and then at some point in the middle of the class, I went, of course, of course, that's what it is. And I'm hugely relieved to have made this discovery, you know, more or less at the end of my working life, right? If that makes some sense. What, so where, why do I use them? Where do I use them? Yeah. Well, I think I've gone off a bit, the thread a bit now, but I mean, why don't you talk about the same question, Lisa? Uh, you know, oh. this relationship between the two. Well, I think I love what you're talking about. I love the concept uh, of finding them. I, I see them, you know, we got, I've got this chart for inspired action behind me. Yeah. And this is, yeah. It's a variation of the one that Michael Chekhov hand drew for Mala. Yeah. And, um, and you know each box has holds a tool that one can use and yeah. what and over here i've got the archetypal gestures yeah. and what your what you, the image you've just given me is that this isn't just it's another box that we can put on this chart yeah yeah um, each thing on the chart brings a certain color to your work and addresses yeah. a particular thing. It, it, it gives you more about the feeling life or it gives you more about the thinking life, about the characterization, about your artistic life. It, it has a role and they're all present in, in peak performances when you're happy on the stage, as Mr. Chekhov would say. So what you're saying, and so one of the things I say about everything on the chart mm -hmm. is that anyone, who, they don't need to know anything about Chekhov, uh, anyone who, who is in a peak performance, in a flowing, happy performance, one could identify or analyze or deconstruct their performance mm -hmm. using everything on this chart. And yep. so... I could look at any great performance and find these six, seven speech gestures as yep. well. Yep. Yes. And so um, I, I always teach the speech gestures as part of our advanced course yep. I, because I think they're really f fantastically powerful. And, um, but I never quite made that connection between the archetypal gestures which when, when I teach an archetypal gesture, I say it is training us to be able to engage ourselves in a pure act of will. Yeah. With yeah. no thought, with no emotion, no feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So if the psychology, when Chekhov says psychology, he's talking psyche, he's talking thinking, feeling, willing forces. Yeah. The archetypal gesture is pure will. That's right. Yeah. When you add a reason to do it, which is the thinking force, and when you add a how, which is the feeling force, it becomes a psychological oh. gesture. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the archetypal gesture is a pure training process because the moment you actually give it context, it's transformed yeah. into a psychological gesture. But the, uh, there are, there's a whole branch of checkoff people who use the word archetype in relation to gesture as simply to mean big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grand yeah. of grand size. They say yeah. the psychological gesture must be archetypal. And yeah. what, they're, what they're meaning is the psychological gesture when you physically do it must be very big. Yeah, as big as you can make it. Yes, yeah, I know that position. And, as well mm -hmm. yeah so for everyone who's who's with us to understand that i believe and sarah you can adjust this if this isn't in alignment with you but um that when we talk about archetype we're talking about that which we know which we were never taught uh it's it's an ideal that exists in another dimension and it can be an ideal way of communicating it can be an ideal way of uh, uh, an ideal thing you want which is uh, the will i want to push i want mm -hmm. to pull i want to lift i want to smash i want to gather i want to throw mm -hmm. and for everyone's information michael chekhov never made a definitive list 
of what <laughs> was an archetypal gesture. And if you look in, uh, in, I think, I think it's lessons to the professional actor, to the actor, and on the technique of actor, each of them has a paragraph with a bunch of verbs listed yeah. and they're all different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we and could then you can pick up a book like uh, Glossary of Actions by Maria Calderone. Uh, I don't know if you know this book, but it's, you know, it's, it's this thick and it's full of possible actions. There must be several thousand. And of course, they can all be turned into to some kind of gesture. Yeah. Precisely. And so when we... Uh, when we look at, for me, I consider, I use this sort of directions as my six basic archetypes yeah. uh, to push, bring something from the center to the periphery mm -hmm. and generally frontal and, uh, and to pull brings from the periphery to you yeah. and then lift brings it from below to above and smash from that above to it below. Yeah. yeah. And then the and then gather left and right yeah, yeah. comes yeah. there and uh and yeah so, and that process so i i see those six and then i work work with the six or seven speech gestures and i've often tried to figure out how they fit and what i'm wondering is uh i bet there's a lot of people who've never heard of these six seven speech gestures and I, I see things about them. So maybe Sarah, would you share more about what those gestures are? I can certainly do that if you don't mind listening for a bit, you guys. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the first, each, yeah. So there are three aspects to each of these gestures, right? And the first aspect is purely the physical movement. And I have adopted the practice of making these speech gestures into archetypal gestures. And so the first action is pointing. And if we're aware of the Chekhov work, we know that there's a moment where we receive the sensation. We become, allow ourselves to become aware of the sensation that arises out of these gestures, because that's what we work with. You know, we, we do the gesture, we cross the threshold onto the stage or wherever, and we work with that inner gesture, the sensation of the outer gesture, yeah? So, and that has an effect, has the potential to have an effect upon the voice. If the voice has a certain degree of flexibility, I have to say it does need that. Right. So the first gesture um, is is called pointing. Right. We work with pointing. And the intention is that it makes the voice clear. That's the only quality. And then then it, it sort of the gesture is given a name. And, and I'm just going to probably name it for this one, because otherwise this whole thing is going to take far too long. Um, but it, the third word that is given describes the effect that this clear voice has upon the audience. So what does the listener receive when he or she receives a word spoken in great clarity? Yeah. Another word that is used, not just clear, it's also used, it's described as incisive. And as I say the word incisive, I'm trying to demonstrate what that is, right? And you can really feel it in the sounds of the words in, the, in this repeated vowel, E-I-E, -I -E, incisive. And the sharp S, it's, it brings a certain sharpness to the voice, incisiveness, yeah? And that is that this is somebody who is very clear in their thinking and, you know, very, um, uh, uh, and very able. It creates a certain kind of character. If you speak purely with an incisive, clear voice, you know, you will do whatever that person asks you to do. Yeah. So we also, it, we're also told 
what sort of language is this gesture applicable to? So it's for statements and for commands, orders, for, um, uh, what's the word, Lisa? You know, when you say, it, uh, maybe you're not, I don't know, we'll find out. If I say, sit down, right? A command, a command. Uh, that, that's a command, but it's a particular form of grammar that I can't remember at the moment. Um, okay. Anyway. Perhaps that's not so important. Yeah, so that's the first one. And this has a correspondence because I'm starting with my own center, with myself. Of course, speaking from this perspective, everything, all the words, we radiate them from the center of the chest. Of course we do. Even if the words physically come out of my mouth, they radiate from the center of the chest. Um, it's the, it, it has a correspondence to expanding, mm -hmm. right? This particular gesture. And uh, I'll just go to the second one where we do exactly the opposite. It's described as holding on to a part of the body. So you might want to put an arm on your shoulder, the other, the, a hand on your shoulder hand on your shoulder or you might want to bend forward put your hands on your knees right and you you would probably get the idea relatively quickly this is a uh, contraction is another name for this for this gesture and the effect on the voice if we really listen to the sensation that it creates is that it makes it round and full-bodied and what the audience hears when they hear you speaking, saying something like, well, I'm not sure about that. They might hear that you're thinking, you're reflecting about something, right? So the, the name of the first gesture, which I haven't named yet, is effective. The first gesture makes your speech effective. The second makes your speech reflective and thoughtful. And so where we'll tend to use it is for monologues. When I'm just sitting there and going to be or not to be, right? Classic example, of course, right? So then we go on. I'm, we work with sympathy and antipathy. Sympathy is reaching out, makes the voice soft. Antipathy is flinging the arms and legs away from the body, which would mean you should be able to fly if you're really going to do it. Because, but you can only fling one leg and both arms. You've got to be able to stand on one leg. And that makes the voice hard. Yeah, if you really listen to that gesture, that's antipathy, everything to do with aggression, right? Sympathy is obviously everything to do with love, like, kindness, empathy, all the different words that you can think of. Um, and it makes the voice soft. And then we have two perhaps slightly strange gestures from their names and from their description. These are the last two. One is it's the arms and hands slant away from the body. Please remember these were descriptions given 96 years ago. Right, so Chekhov, Chekhov was not, well, he was on the planet, yes, but certainly the simplicity of Chekhov's terminology is, so you, everything is at angles and it involves a step backwards, which is, and it's a kind of separating. It's not the anger aggression of never, right, that you get with the fling. It's simply a no no thank you i don't i can't meet you today i'm too busy right it's so and the final one is perhaps the most mis, uh, most mysterious it's described as a rolling forward motion of the arms and hands that you do with your whole body right so it's a step forwards and you come back to yourself it's a step forwards again it's a rolling motion and it's about trying to get through against resistance. 
it's um, feeling forwards against resistance and it's what we use when we're asking questions i don't know something i don't understand it and i want to understand and i want to sort of move through the fog of my not understanding yeah and it and it brings a slight tremor of uncertainty into the voice because i don't know and i know you know you my partner on the stage so those are the six in a very brief mangled form excuse me please did that make any sense uh, absolutely absolutely and i see some of us were kind of doing it along with you and can can feel what that is and one of the things that i had not looked at but just came as you were speaking was um the qualities of, of movement the kinds of movement molding flowing flying radiating uh mm -hmm. you know earth water air light mm -hmm. and their correlation to these right yeah um, I, well i think you know you're free to find them aren't you absolutely i mean obviously there's some fire in the gesture of antipathy for mm -hmm. example and in the first one, I mean, we sort of group them, you know, there are three gestures that mo more go out and there are three that more come towards me in some way. Yeah. So mm. there's a real breathing between them yeah, of, of, you know, with the first two expansion contraction and then the others addressing particular psychological situations that we find ourselves in yeah. on the stage. And of course they're, they're very general they're very universal right and they're not the only things we work with but they 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 are a very useful starting point for actors with text and they uh have a correlation to thinking feeling willing yeah that too yeah uh, so uh, although we usually work with that in a different way because there is a relationship in the speech instrument between the head the trunk the lower limbs and in the speech instrument the soft palate the hard palate and the lips so uh, just in brief the soft palate which is the place where we speak such consonants as g and k yeah if you can hear me the soft palate that's the place where the whole of our speech instrument is available to us it's where the voice is most powerful is strongest it's not very subtle in that place it's not very refined or defined but it has a power so yes would be speaking from the soft palate right and and that's the place of the will so it relates, so everything, when we're engaged with the will, yeah, with that belly center, we could say our speech center, when we're speaking and we have a character with a will center, is on the soft palate. Oh. And then, so that's sort of more how we work with, um, th that's one example, lips, feelings, it, it's not one to one. It's not from bottom up. Yeah, it's not back, middle, forwards. Right. It's uh, the lips are the home of our feelings in speech. So that corresponds to the center of the chest. Right. And I mean, this is one of the great discoveries. It's such another, you know, help for actors, which is kind of obvious to a speech person, but not to an actor right it, it to, uh, and then when you come to the teeth yeah um, that's the third placement where we form consonants we have g k d t and b p yeah they those are the three main placements for consonants for sounds all together and they have this correspondence to these three centers um, imaginary centers so the teeth and the hard palate directly behind the hard palate where where so many consonants are formed 
is uh, has a relationship to our thinking right and then we also relate thinking feeling and willing to different kinds of texts right so story is an expression of actions and events so it's will again they're huge generalizations but they're directions right and when we come to working with our feelings that's lyric poetry i mean it, it's not this is not really rocket science. If you sat and thought about it, you'd come to it. And as soon as you're in the dramatic, you've got one point of view, another point of view that takes us more predominantly into our thinking. Yeah. So for all dramatic texts, we use the hard teeth, uh, sorry, teeth and hard palate placement. So instead of yes, it becomes yes. Speech acquires a sharpness, and then, yes, it acquires a softness for lyric poetry. Could you give us an example of texts that fall into those three categories? Yeah, I mean, you take fables, for example. Wonderful example, yeah, of, of the story in miniature. One stormy night. A raging north wind pitted its strength against a magnificent oak, which now lay on the ground. A fox, whose lair was not far away, saw it next morning. What a magnificent oak, he cried. I would never have thought it had been so big. So what I was working with was working with the soft palette, make, trying to make the words round and full, one stormy night. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then giving the fox the quality of the teeth, hard palate, the thinker. What a magnificent oak. Yeah? Just as an example. Um, and of course, lyric poetry, well, um, so I don't, so that was combining the two, but of course, lyric, lyric doesn't really appear in the, um, in fables, um, but any story has dramatic epic in it. So you can play with different colors, right? Mm -hmm. um, dramatic generally meaning more dialogue driven exchange type. Yeah, of even, even monologue. Yeah. Yeah. Drama everything that has, that comes from a play. Mm -hmm. from a piece of theater or a script a film script some you know anything like that and where you are in conversation with somebody yeah that's absolutely right in the world of lyric i'm in my own little bubble really right i'm i'm just lost in my feelings and the feelings just float gently to the ground and i wandered lonely as a cloud for example yeah it's much softer slower we're trying to make story three-dimensional that words have three dimensions yeah anyway i'm doing five yeah your turn lisa not mine <laughs> well i it, it's very exciting to me um and and i'd like to do a sort of a shift uh because that was fantastic and i think uh, we've been given a tremendous amount of information. I think most of us can feel how uh, interesting it would be to get a chance to work more deeply with this and and, yeah. and apply it. I have some questions about um, speech training in general across the theatrical board. Yeah. Um, regarding, um, you know, so I, I mean, I launched this by saying that there was a lot of training that I experienced and uh, where we were just doing the work and the checkoff work and we were not connecting our voices. And most of us who experienced that realized that this was not a, a, a good service. So I began integrating voice during the mm -hmm. exercises to make sure that the voice, we're allowing the voice to be responsive to images. And so that is sort of the primary way I've been working with it. Great. But on top of that, 
um, is this question of, of theater training for voice. And I know um, Arthur Lessac, who has a well-known acting technique, mm -hmm. uh, Arthur attended um, the first uh, workshop in 1993 that Mala and Will and I did at an association for theater in higher education. Well, that's and, exciting. I didn't know that. Great. Yeah. And he was absolutely thrilled and, and felt very connected to it. And, uh, and there is, there have been statements that said that Cecily Berry was a student of Michael Chekhov's. And in 19, in, in uh, 2015, at the Southeastern Theater Conference, which has like 4,000 people at it. Um, it's the year before I had been the guest master teacher in acting, and my counterpart the following year was Kristen Linklater. Right. Yeah. Rest in peace. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So Kristen and I had lengthy conversations, and uh, and I launched into and provoked by her about her love of Michael Chekhov's work. And uh, in the workshops that she was doing in 2015, I saw, I saw a lot of it and I didn't know if, if she was bringing more into it because I was there or, <laughs> you know, yeah, she did. Having these discussions or, or what, but there was quite a, uh, quite a bit of interlinking. And, um, and Catherine Fitzmorris's work, uh, which, really sort of enters the field by loosening, um, you know, really loosening the, the musculature, so to speak, so that it can be responsive, uh, seem to have, you know, seem, seems to dovetail really nicely. And so it leads me to a question. I'm not an expert in any of those. I know we have some uh, highly trained voice people among us. Um, okay. Uh, that that um, what what would what is Steiner's speech work as you've been developing it the, the Sarah Kane version of, <laughs> of the merged the Chekhovai Steiner what does it offer us that um, might be missing? Yeah, well, I should first say that you know because this this Steiner speech training is a long one. It's four years full time, right? Uh, yeah, and well, you're supposed to be able to demonstrate some skills at the end of it, not just know the information, but be able to actually show it and teach it. It's a teaching qualification more than anything um, that you've embodied certain things. Look, so I have never spent a lot of time investigating these other techniques. I know them, but I only know them really peripherally, right? I know of all these four, but I've never actually been to a workshop. But I, I can say what Steiner positively offers. So I, and perhaps it's a good thing I can't sort of compare. But what I can say is that yes, we work on the instrument, but our main focus to it is actually on the words. And it's seeing in the same way as we're trying to enliven, give life to a character, give life to a place or a time in a play, right? Or in a film or whatever. Our whole effort is towards this enlivening. What's that word? Inspired, right? That we are inspired. So I will talk about this is a way to co come to inspired speaking, right? How do we do that? By giving all our attention to the words. And so I have come to talk about words, not as things or as objects. And because Steiner's work actually encourages this, but as living beings, just as Chekhov invites us to know that our character is not us, not even, a, we put ourself, ourselves at the character's disposal, that we can embody this character, but he is not me or she is not me and I am not him or her. And it's the same with words. 
I, my starting point, and it's, it's a huge shift in how I look at what speaking is. And that is, it's, it's tapping into the life that is in words. It's already there, right? That life is already there. And the life is, pre that is given to the words by the sounds and by the image. So it's a combination of the two things that we're always working with. How do I develop a living relationship to every single sound? And so this morning I was wrestling with who is oh in French? I have to discover it. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, my French is far more rusty than my German is, right? So, um, and we're asking, you know, what, what color is on? Oh? the sound, the, the vowel sound, oh, yeah? What shape, is it old or is it young? You know, I ask all these questions about sounds. Is it, you know, what, what, what kind of character is this sound to keep my own inner life going and connected? Words, you know, the last thing we want to do is to be speaking out of here. We're really trying to speak out from here from this center and without that life without finding that life i don't have to drag it up from myself it's there it's waiting for me those words are waiting for me to ask them who they are wow that's inspiring <laughs> very inspiring yeah yeah i hope so because i mean you can tell that you know i started this work I started this training when I was 27, I think. So that's now, yeah, that's now 40 years ago. And I am, there's not one second that I, you know, I've come to not just love it, but to, to you know, value it, you know, every day a bit more. Every day I'm, I'm still discovering things about it, about words, about sounds about how to convey it about how words move and want to move and if they don't move i cannot have a conversation if i don't let words move if i don't give them away and let them have their own life then the person who's receiving what i am giving yeah he can't receive them because i haven't given anything so yeah, it's, it's endless. It's absolutely endless. You know, I sometimes think about um, what is, uh, you know, uh, the, the title of this series is Michael Chekhov Masters Talk. Talks, yeah, talk. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but so uh, the question came up, you know, what, what is a master? What what gives one that title or what does that mean? And I think mm -hmm. um, that when this impulse that you just expressed, uh, which I share regarding the checkoff work, yeah, it, it's a, that, yeah. You know, after more than 40 years, I'm still like an infant learning yeah. and speaking and coming up with questions and random moments at any given time in, in one's life going, oh, that's, that's a way to share this, explain this, or that's what yeah. that means more deeply. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, when you have this ongoing, deep, lifelong passion um, that, that still feeds and, and you continue to bring it forward, bring it forward, bring it forward. It's, yeah. uh, it's a blessing to I think, find and have a thing in one's life that leads one and inspires one like yeah. that. Yeah. And it, well, it certainly keeps me young, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. It does, uh, it really. I, um, I see a, a link between, of course, the grand logos. Yeah. Just the whole That's concept true. of logos. Yeah. And the, what it means to create through the word and yeah. through speech as a, an, a creative act mm -hmm. and to understand the origins of language which carried and have lost, but mm 
but perhaps we can seek to restore yep. uh, the, the spiritual power of the sound. Yeah. Right? Yep. And last week we had a wonderful session that Jorg led purely based on the text, looking at how discovering each section of a, a word or two within the text uh, taking it just completely out of everything, no yeah. characterization, no situation, no atmosphere or anything. Just look at that word um, and, and see when that word is given, what images, how, how does the next word adjust the images that were formed from the previous word? Yeah. yeah. So Wonderful. what, you know, what you're sharing just sort of expands upon that and gives us greater insight into um, how powerful that is. Um, can you tell us um, a little more, at, if, is there anything you'd like to share about the relationship between the speech work and the life of these living, the living beings within the sounds and the words and Eurythmy? Okay. Well, of course, I mean, I, I don't know how familiar people are here with Eurythmy as a, as a, an, the, an art of movement, right? Which, um, and what it does is, it's actually happening more now that you see silent Eurythmy, but predominantly Eurythmy was given to express in movement what lives in words very often it's poetry but not only it can also be in story sometimes it's in dramatic monologues as well and also in music and their only instruments for developing how they move is when you're working with um when you're working with text is the sounds and every sound has a gesture for Eurythmy. Now this gesture can be modified in myriad ways, but the first thing you learn are the archetypal forms of the sounds, the archetypal gestures for the sounds. And certainly as speakers, they're incredibly helpful because they awaken a sensation out of which you can then speak the sound. So you can absolutely use, so, you know, if, in, in Eurythmy, you usually begin with the vowels when you're learning it, right? So you'll start with R or A or E. And the gestures sometimes have a relationship to the written form of the sound. Interestingly enough, you see that the letter encapsulates something of the, of the being, of the essence of what the sound is. Yeah? So R is pure openness, right? And when you look at a capital, the, the, the letter for capital A, of course, you've got this openness. It's inverted, but it's there. Or you take the sound E the vowel E, it, the, the gesture, the movement is pure verticality, up and down. Yeah, I can't do it very well at the moment. Sorry, sitting on my dress. Right, and then I'm doing the same thing with the other arm going down. That's E. So what happens when you make that gesture and you e. listen to the sensation and then you speak the sound? Try it. Ah, is pure expansion with the arms. If you want to translate it into Chekhov, yeah? Or E is pure verticality, up and down, up with the right arm, down with the left arm. Mm. And then listen to what that does to you, how that resounds in you. Listen to what, uh, and then speak the sound. So these gestures for sounds or gestures for words or gestures for syllables are incredibly helpful incredibly helpful hello say hello to, to us will please 
Hello. <laughs> this, is, this is my NMCA uh, partner, teaching partner. We've been teaching together since, we've been working together since 1988. Oh, wow, great. It, it was Will's um, uh, idea to create that ATHA conference that uh, Arthur Lessac was at. So, um, uh, yeah. so that's great. Uh, welcome, Will. And, um, and I see that Vadim said uh, here, hi Vadim, would you unmute for us? And Vadim, you, you mentioned um, that you've been studying with Kristen for five years. Can yeah. You, uh, how, how much of the checkoff work are you familiar with and did you feel that there, you saw intersections in your work with Kristen? Uh, hello, hello everybody. Hello, Lisa. Thank you very much, Sarah. This is incredible. I mean, I'm 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 so happy that I'm in, I'm here with you, and this is really such a pleasure. Um, I've been doing Linklater work for seven years and five years for the past five years with Kristen personally in Scotland, and last September I started Mikhail Chekhov's work with Jorg. Mm -hmm. And here I realized how much there is in Linklater work of Chekhov. This is absolutely incredible. This is all body emotion relations. So first comes the body, sensations, not feelings, and then the imagery. This is incredible how much uh, Linklater work is based on imagery um, and the body work and every everything comes from the body to your sensations you you're being aware of what's going on with you physically and then it manifests in your emotional world so this is absolutely incredible and Kristen Linklater actually um boosted my desire to come back to theater because I'd been doing theater like back in the 90s in the beginning of the 90s uh and now I'm back with movies and theater Thanks to Jorg and Kristen. I'm so happy to be with you. Thank you, Vadim. Thank you for sharing that. Can and I just add one last sentence then? I would say one thing that nobody else has developed is the work with sounds. That's the one thing that sets that that can could be added to all these techniques, clearly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and this concept of the sound as a being, yeah, the different sounds as beings, and the depth, um, and that the sound as the sound by itself as a creative force, yeah, uh, yeah, that's that, right, yeah, that, that certainly how Steiner talks about them. That, or let's say that there are creative forces in the world which have created the world and which now that human beings are on the world manifest as sounds that's how i would describe it yeah does that make sense yes that's how steiner talks about it anyway yeah so in them in the sounds there is something more present there is yeah hello um my my question, Sarah, just where you were talking about um, your your beginnings that you went to speech when you were uh, seven and, and, and that way of enunciating words instead of kind of, you know, being quite relaxed and not yeah. like when you talk about applying that, for example, to um, like the work that you do, for example, to modern speech versus kind of historical and what you could say this well-spoken even if it's different accents but yeah. how do you when you talk about a sound that somebody makes that feeling if someone isn't finishing uh, a word are you talking about a character or an actor um well i mean i suppose they, they 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 interlink don't they like if if it if it's something that you're trying to create i suppose that that's intentional then with with a with a character but as an actor you need to be aware yeah of that yeah i would say so yeah i mean you need to be able to play with your voice as an instrument 
in as much as you can play with your uh, with your body as an instrument in the Chekhov work that you can modify it adjust yeah you can raise the pitch you can lower the pitch you can change the tempo you can you can work with colors with shapes and uh, all kinds of you know work with temperature is your voice warm or cold yeah all sorts of things like that can be worked on um now when i was put into those they were called elocution classes at the time right mm -hmm. And they were purely, it was purely class-based. You know, my mother did, want, did not want me to sound as if I came from the working class, where they didn't speak properly in her view, right? And in her family's view, it was actually more her family than her, to be fair to her. Uh, that was a purely technical thing, right? And of course, you can, you can work with a voice like that, with an accent like that, that doesn't speak all the sounds but you can still work with it artistically and not naturalistically. Yeah, it should be possible to do that. Is that, I mean, yeah, anything, yeah. it's a technique that should make anything possible with the voice. As Chekhov, I think, makes anything possible with the body, with the imagination, with movement, yeah? Mm. Like if, if it were something, if you were combining, for example, if you're doing that, like a, a speech gesture um, connected to those vowel sounds, for example, but something that's unfinished, that that's, that says something about the character as well, if they don't stand strong in that sound. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right, okay. yeah. Let's say a word is unfinished. That might be a habit of a character. And that's picking up on what Lisa was saying about, um, about the, work, the, the conversation last week when, they were look, when you were looking at a text and looking at, you would notice those things and the speech gestures, as soon as you go into transforming words into movement, you notice things about words that you don't notice otherwise. Mm -hmm. Anjali, did you have, want to share something? Thank you. I, just have a, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, and it's going back to the six gestures. Um, and I just missed the title of one. Um, I know there's effective and reflect, um, effective and reflective. Yeah. Sympathy and antipathy. And, and then sympathy. And then what was the, the one that oh, paired with the, the pulling back? Oh, <laughs> withdrawing yes. into your own ground. And then, right. and the third one was feeling forwards against resistance. Yeah. Right so much is there a chart easily available um i have i have um handouts from sarah uh and and also sarah on uh i have one with just the sixth and one with the seventh do you want to speak for a moment about the seventh well it, it's an extension of the second and, and that's pro that's probably enough it, it's a it's an oddity it's, you know, why, why isn't it number seven properly? There's two A and there's two B, right? So there's reflective and then there's so much thinking that you're incapable of doing anything, right? You become absolutely, yeah, it's completely letting go, yeah. Hopefully everyone is a, um, a part of the um, International Michael Chekhov Facebook International Michael Chekhov Association Facebook page. Uh, invite everyone, share everyone to, to become a member of that. Uh, so I will post the, um, the link. Uh, I usually post the link to these in there so that you'll be able to, to get it from there. And then if you have, um, you can email to me and I'll put this in um, here. Um, and Sarah, do you want to do you want us to include your email? Yeah, sure. Please do. Yeah, yeah. A R A S A R dot K A N at hotmail dot com. Sarkan. I will say one thing to you. This work is disappearing. Um, I won't be doing it for the next thirty years. I think it's unlikely anyway. 
There is one training in the USA which has one student, so I don't know how long it will survive. That's a full-time training. I, and the teacher is in her 70s, mid-70s. And there is... Uh, an, most people who have trained in it are now sort of between 55 and 80 in age. Yes, I do, Ben. Um, so if you find anybody and if you're interested in this, please don't wait for two years because half the people who are actually still using it might be dead by then or have had to retire. And very serious, it's in a, this work actually is in a, I know it sounds funny, I try to make it humorous, I try to make it not so serious, but actually it's on the verge of disappearing, right? It's, my one hope is I've started teaching this work in a British university drama department, the University of Staffordshire, right? Where I'm, I'm working with second and third year students. Um, but apart from that, I also run a part-time training in England. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you find someone or if, if you're interested in it, please write to me. You don't have to come and do my training because it's in the UK. There are people I can connect you with if you want to do some more of this. If you want to just find out a bit more in practice what this work is about. Yeah. I can put you in touch with people, you know, it, because I believe it deserves a future. I believe it is, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not sort of just, I'm passionate about it for myself, but I want to give it the chance of a future life here on earth, as it were. So I have to say that I'm saying it to everybody. You're no exception. <laughs> Hi, first of all, thank you so, so much. I, it's, it was just, uh, it was an, I, I don't know how to say in English, it was an embrace of, of, of knowledge and, and a gift. I had a quick question going back. You mentioned that each of the speech gestures have three aspects to them. Yeah. Could you review what those three aspects yeah. are? The first is the movement, the pointing, the holding on, the, the rolling forward movement. Um, I'm not doing them in the right order. The, the uh, slanting away of the arms and hands, the flinging of the arms and legs away from the body and reaching. So those are the six actions or movements, right? Then there's the impact on the voice, which for, for effect, it, it, in the order, effect, uh, pointing is clear and incisive. Uh, Holding on is round and full, full-bodied. Um, uh, uh, reaching is uh, soft. Flinging away is hard. Slanting away of the arms and hands from the body, I, I know I didn't mention that one, is abrupt. It makes the voice, it makes you speak the words abruptly. No, thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, for example. Uh, and the final one, the rolling forward movement, that makes, it, it makes the voice, it, it, uh, wavering is the word we use. Mm -hmm. Wavering, yeah. And actually, although it's called feeling forwards against resistance, we also call it questioning. That helps. We call it questioning as well. Then the effect on the audience, effective thoughtful, sympathetic, antipathetic, um, withdrawing, separating. And the last one is um, questioning. My gesture, my movement, the effect on my voice, the effect on the audience. Uh, you might be doing Chekhov on the beach in Greece or something. That's like that. true, but it's mainly Chekhov, but then with a little bit of speech. Yeah. Uh that's Greek gods and goddesses. But I'm not 100% sure it's going to happen. Let's not forget that. I don't know if I can get to Greece at the moment. Not 100% sure. I might know in a week or two. Yeah. So my email's on there. If you're interested in joining that, just send me an email and I can let you know if it's happening or not. Okay? 
and uh, if we uh, if there's interest and demand, then we can create you know uh, we can create a, a an opportunity for to bring Sarah to us. Yeah. So uh, if you have a school, if you have a space, something like that, we can That's help. That's right. Coordinate. I am open to being invited. Absolutely. If you have circumstances where it's possible, then, yeah, you know how to get in touch with me now. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I waited for this meeting and um, you sure, yeah, it was very inspiring. Thank you. Good. And... Um, my question is, you said something about historically, you know something about Chekhov and uh, Steiner. What do we know about them? Did they meet? Did they talk? Did they exchange? Yes, they did. Yes, they did meet. Um, they met in Arnhem in Holland in 1923, I think, but I couldn't put my hand on the fire for that date. Um, Rudolf Steiner was lecturing in Holland and Chekhov had the opportunity to leave Moscow. You know, he was a celebrated, a highly celebrated artist. You know, they had all these levels and that gave them uh, of, of accolade, of recognition, and that gave him the opportunity to travel. I mean, in 1923, that wasn't funny, right? Trying to, no, normal people couldn't get out of Russia at the uh. time, but he could. So he went to Steiner's lectures in Holland and he asked for a private conversation and I can tell you the source of it, but the book is in German, unfortunately. Um, but, and he went, <laughs> he went to Rudolf Steiner and said, I want to become a priest in the church that you have founded, which is called the Christian community. He wasn't interested in continuing with acting at the time because life had become so difficult for him. And Rudolf Steiner looked at him and said, but how do you want to do that? He said, you know, this church only exists in Germany um, at the moment or in Switzerland where Steiner was working. And um, he said, you don't speak German. How are you going to do it? You know, Steiner was always practical at least. And instead, he, he said, instead, will you please do something else? He said, you are developing an acting technique. Will you please continue to develop it? Because it was by, um, uh, will you please continue to develop it? And will you write it down? So Chekhov had Rudolf Steiner saying that one thing to him in, um, in Holland by Steiner. And of course, Stanislavski said exactly the same thing to him. And I don't know now if it was before or afterwards. So that was what, you know, thanks to those two individuals, we now have the books. We yeah. now have the written work because we might not otherwise. And Chekhov would have gone and left no trace. That's the nature of theater. Yeah. He also asked uh, his, his Russian Orthodox uh, guru guy. Uh, yeah. yeah. About it, who who also said no 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 <laughs> you got to stay here. stay doing what do keep doing what you're doing yeah, yeah. so yeah. he got the message ultimately yeah can yeah. I I just add a word um, well I'm probably the only Russian here in this group and I live in Moscow oh so Moscow is a great idea so Lisa okay. Sarah yeah. can't come to Moscow we're yeah. gonna set okay. this workshop Yorg is coming regularly okay. so <laughs> That would be great yeah. if you could uh, be with yeah. us. That would be fantastic. Please do that. Absolutely. Yes. I think I think we have uh, Maria and Kirill and uh, a number and Alina. Oh yeah. Uh, oh all yeah. More more Russians here. Yep. Our Russian contingent. Right. right. Sure. Yeah. Will. And sure. Along those lines, I would love to have you follow up to one of our checkoff intensives in New Mexico. So I have the space. We have a beautiful theater there. So if wow. we can get you to the U.S. and we can get enough interest to do that uh, next summer, hopefully. Obviously, now things are a little shut down. But for next summer, I think that would be a great workshop to do. Lovely. Well, thank you. Um, I, I cannot tell you what it means to me to talk about this work and to have so much interest shown in it. Because for decades, it's been sidelined. Yeah, Nobody's been interested. And it's you just fight against 
you're, you're swimming against the tide and you're fighting against the odds. So to have this, to be on the receiving end of all this openness and generosity towards what I've been talking about, it means a huge amount. And it, I have come to believe that the tide is turning for this work, but something's got to happen now. You know, yeah, next summer is great. You know, I'm glad it's not in five years because who knows if I will be, you know, if I will still have all my faculties in five years. <laughs> we just never know anymore. <laughs> so great, Will. Thank you. And thank you to all the others for, for your, what you've brought towards this conversation. And thank you, Lisa, for the invitation to come and talk about the speech work here. It, again, it means a huge amount. It's uh, been, I've been honoring you in all the, the Deeper by Demands as our yeah. course, you. uh, sharing you. your work, giving people tastes of it. And, um, and so the idea that next summer you'll, you'll be able to come and, and uh, we'll follow our, our week long uh, intensive with uh, a program with you would be absolutely fantastic. Great. Uh, I see a lot of, a lot of positive reinforcement and, um, and definitely, uh, Jorg and I are hoping to be back uh, back in Russia in the fall, late fall. Right. And, um, and I know you were in Russia, right, Sarah? I was, in a, in a different context. I don't know if anybody here has heard of the Nikolai Demidov work. But Nikolai Demidov also was an advocate of this approach to speech from a totally different perspective, right? totally different. So I, ha I did last summer contribute to a Demidov workshop with this speech, which, you know, it's something, it's something, it's something is beginning to happen. Yeah. Even in my high school, I had, uh, we had little bit Steiner technology because the school was called like Valdorska school. Okay. And so my first lessons of it, it was when I was like eight or nine, but I didn't understand it really because we had no. some you read me and we had something even with letters but for us it was like kind of gym so we were kids and we didn't understand and just okay. later when i went to drama school and like finished drama school and then with vladimir Beicher we started like checkoff technique i yeah. like really realized that i had it in my like um, school when i was a child so oh, it was funny. very interesting yeah. then, even right now when i was listening to the letters and then i remember that they tried to give us when i was like eight in summer camp in Russia <laughs> and now wow. it all comes into one system so that's why for me it's very valuable <laughs> thank wow. you very well much. thank you for sharing that very much thank you thank, thank you, you so much Sarah thank you, thank you very much take care